Enterprise Computing Preliminary Course Unit 3, Principles of Cybersecurity. So as the name suggests here, now we're looking at enterprise systems in the context of they have lots of information, a lot of user accounts signed up to it. We need measures in place to protect that data. And that's what cybersecurity is all about. And so what we're going to look at in this unit is the different principles that can help make our systems more secure, but also identify vulnerabilities that might leave our system open to people potentially accessing our information and identify them so we can put structures in place in order to protect that data. So the first area of this is obviously understanding privacy and security. Privacy being that information about people is private. It is their information. They voluntarily given it up to a system but they don't want everyone seeing it. Okay, and there are laws in place that support that. And then the security side of it are the measures we put in place to protect that privacy. Different types of things such as passwords, biometrics, okay, a two-factor authentication, all of that is put in place to keep data private on systems uh, that are online. So going through this, the first area is that of privacy, trust, and freedom of information. So we've said privacy relates to being acknowledging that information related to people is sensitive and we've got to keep that private. Trust relates to the fact that people trust our system that when they upload their data to our system that things will be in place to protect that data, those aforementioned security areas. And then we have this notion of freedom of information. And this is a legislation that's in place that means that basically when someone puts their data on the system, they have a right to see data that is about them on a system. Now, it might be directly or indirectly that data has gone into a system, such as governments record specific data about people when they sign up for services, such as their driver's license and Medicare and even um, criminal records. Data is kept about people on systems. Freedom of information means people have a right to essentially check those systems to ensure that the data stored about them is correct. All right, and thus supporting the integrity of that system that has correct information about the individual, but also allowing people to know what information is being stored about them. The next area we'll look at is the access, storage, and permissions related to data on systems. Just because this data has been uploaded to a specific enterprise system doesn't mean everyone within the enterprise has that right to view the data. And that's why we put in place access rights and permissions. Okay, based on users' logins within that organization, they would be given specific access rights to different types of data, usually pertaining to what is their job within the organization. Some people would have full rights and can read everything, but in reality, People only need rights to data that pertain to their day-to-day -day work, which means they're not looking at the personal information of every employee or user that accesses this system. And permissions need to be in place because the smaller the circle of people who have access to data, the smaller the vulnerabilities because in many cases, people are the ones that open up vulnerabilities that hackers get into systems. So we need our permissions in place to protect the privacy of the users that have uploaded the information, but also reduce the vulnerabilities. The next area is people acknowledging they need to maintain their own data privacy. Be careful what they upload. Okay, if you put something online, you're pretty much saying, here, look at my information. So we need to be responsive to this and understand and mindful that I'm careful in what I put out there online. And data that is secure, I'm putting it in secure places where I know where the security is if it has to be in digital form. I'm keeping it maybe only stored locally on my system as opposed to online or at an offline system. Something's in place, but I'm conscious that I need to protect my own privacy as well. The next area is that of the vulnerabilities, okay? And specifically through social networking, okay? And how we are at the mercy sometimes of the social network. And if someone's infiltrated that social network, we can put ourselves in a dangerous situation where unknowingly we're giving data to a malicious party. So it could be through account access when I log in and I enter in my login and password. If someone's there and um, they're viewing that data, they'll get my login details and they can potentially use it. And if my passwords are the same across multiple platforms, they'll know it. If the account is behaving funny or has been compromised, that may be confusing and may be cause me to give data unknowingly to a specific malicious party. Okay, so we're really counting on the actual platform that I'm using that they have security in place and different platforms have different securities. 
got to remember these platforms are also internationally based okay so different countries have different rules although they, they are bound by international laws but they've got different national laws themselves and so that provides a gray area with a degree of security and you've really got to trust the networks you commit your data to in that they'll take your security uh, seriously a result of this can be if people get your data it can lead to identity theft. So if once they get your bank account data, if you write your account details to purchase an item from an unreliable website, bang, they've got your bank number, your uh, your name and your CVC. They can use that data then to purchase things for their own behalf on other websites using your money. Okay, and that's what happens with identity theft. So you've got to only purchase from trusted websites. Then we have things such as phishing, where people send you an email saying they're your website, your trusted uh, platform, your social media or your bank, but it's taking you to a fake website that emulates the real website. And then you put in your real login and password, get nowhere, but on their end, they got your login and password. They go to the real site and start using your information. And then also we've got something that's risen in the last few years known as an evil twin. This is a wireless access point that is legitimate. It's set up and it does work for users to connect to. But the people that have set it up are monitoring what you're doing and they're registering your logins, passwords and uh, sensitive information that you're putting in for the purposes of identity theft and gain your data to do malicious things with it. So some really cool stuff's out there and we've got to be aware of these vulnerabilities. Now, the next area then is what are the attributes of when a cybersecurity breach takes place? Well, firstly, this confidentiality of information, has it been retained? Did they get into information? Did they see things? If they did, we need to change things such as our passwords so that the people that know our passwords, it's changed now, they can't get into our things. So we've got to know that and we've got to let our users know that our system's been compromised, okay? So they can do changes on their end too. But ensuring that information has stayed confidential. We've also got to check the integrity of our information on our system. Did the malicious party that got into our system change any of our information? We need to go through it to see if anything's changed because our users on their end who rely on our information may start getting incorrect or offensive data that could be damaging to our enterprise. Some people as well, when they hack into a system, might try to take a system out from functioning. So that's when the availability of information gets affected. Okay, there are things such as DDoSing where they overwhelm the website causing it to crash. Okay, and that takes information offline. So is our information still available to ourselves and to our users? And then finally, bring it home back to those privacy implications. Has people's privacy been breached? What are the measures they need to go through in order to protect their data or change their data so that they stay secure in their own way? All right, and then into the next area, what are things that specifically get exploited, the vulnerabilities during a breach? Our data gets exploited that's stored in our system. People's data about themselves gets exploited, okay, when the data has been accessed in a breach. The processes of our organization and how we do tasks get viewed and people know our inner workings of our system. So they may need to be changed or modified so that these people can't see that vulnerability again to get into our system. And then obviously what technology we're using gets exploited. Okay, our IP addresses and devices okay, provide an opening and so modifications may need to be made there. Okay, and obviously updated to prevent further exploitation. Okay, the next area is security awareness. Okay, that we are aware that we need to have security measures in place in order to protect data. So the first area is knowing the cybercrime threat. So traditional hacking where people try to get into our system uh, through um, un unfair, uh, authorized means, through using IP addresses and different nets to get through and fake a way into our system. Sometimes hacking can be simple as they know a user's password and they just got in that way. So it can even just be an open door and they use it that way and bang, they're in the system. But it's pretty much they're unauthorized getting into a system. We've already mentioned phishing before where we send out an email and it takes you to a pretend site that looks like your authentic platform that you do actually use and you give information willingly. But then that's also evolved into a new thing called smishing, which is the same thing, but instead of email, it's using SMS. So they're sending out links through SMS saying, oh, your account has been compromised. Click on this link to fix up your details. And through SMS, they click on it. And then once again, you give your own details, giving away your information. This is all a part of scamming. There are many types of scamming too as well. So it's not always through phishing and smishing. Could just be they're saying something like, um, these days it's common people message 
uh, out saying, oh, mum and dad, I need help. Can you please wire me some money? But it's actually not from their kids. Okay. And they've clicked on that link and they've willingly sent money to this un authorized party thinking that it was their children so there's many different scams out there that are tricking people into believing it's something authentic and then we have the whole ai level the bots and the botnets trying to get into systems okay and they're relentless because they're technology okay and obviously mapped with ai trying to get through the vulnerabilities of a system finally as i mentioned a bit before one of the biggest openings to getting to a system can be employees within enterprise themselves causing vulnerability. Forgetting to log out of systems, putting their passwords into phishing websites or some sort of scam, giving away their information, okay, thus leaving an opening for people to get into a system and hack it in order to conduct cybercrime. So they are some of the actual threats to enterprise systems. Now, on the other side, We've got to think of security as a, an actual type of almost like health and safety where there's a risk management procedure in place so that we can upskill the people within our organization in what to do and have an actual procedure to protect our system. So a foundation of this is our staff need to have ongoing training so that they know of potential threats and how they can cause vulnerabilities. Okay, train them in, how, in cybersecurity so that they use systems safely and prevent these vulnerabilities. Okay, through training, they learn about identifying and man managing these vulnerabilities. What things can they do? So changing their password regularly, ensuring they log out of systems, not sharing their information, that kind of stuff in order to protect the data of the system. When a breach takes place, how to assess what was the impact, what got viewed, who do we need to contact, what data on our end needs to change. And then with that, controlling the damage and loss of data reverting to backups, modifying things that did get changed, letting our users know what happened so we can hopefully keep a decent public image even though we did have a security breach. But that's a worst case scenario and we don't want to get to that level. The next area is that of assessing the cyber risk and implementing risk management. So looking at the internal and external implications, so based on the actual system itself, how's the system being affected internally with its structures functioning and employees of the organization but also those outside parties how have our users been impacted how's the environment been impacted okay what is the threat landscape out there of what took place and how does it impact our system okay and which leads to the next point what is the impact of the actual exposure okay has data been leaked are we being held for ransom which is quite common out there these days and they where they mightn't leak all our data because they want a payment being made to them okay and then we've got to weigh that up in what's the likelihood our system will be exploited and all our data will be out there this is why it is so important we are managing cybersecurity and have these measures in place these things do happen and it can destroy a business. Okay, if they leak data, no one's going to trust that business again. It can lead to them going out of business altogether. Okay, within our actual system, then we have the actual protection methods. How do we protect data with our IT? First is the notion of isolation. When malicious software gets caught by antivirus software, it puts it into isolation for the actual administrators to review. Is this actual software malicious in many cases it might be based on its virus signatures and thus before it even gets to the system we can eliminate it and delete it so it didn't impact on the wider system there physical security within our organization that data is stored within locked rooms okay we have cameras in place and technology physical components that protect the actual data on our systems other backup locations, physical hard drives and network locations and servers for storing data in multiple places in case we do lose data. And then we have those network access methods of biometrics, checking people's biology, such as their facial recognition scans and thumbprints to give them access to a system, as well as passwords for the typing in of strings of characters that people use to identify themselves in conjunction with their logins. The use of encryption for scrambling data during transmission, obviously done prior to transmission, so that if it is in transmission, it's intercepted, it comes up scrambled, but the receiver on the other end of the data has the encryption key to revert that symbol scrambled data back into readable form. Firewalls that check data coming in from various sources, and if it's an untrusted sources, it will block the entry of that data into the system. The use of multi-factor authentication, which is very big at the moment, which means you log into a system, and then once you've logged in, 
as it says, multi-factor, a secondary alert gets sent out to that user for them to authenticate themselves again, which may come through either SMS or through their email, a message saying you're trying to log into this system. Here's a verification code, enter this now, and then they've used another way to get into the system as well. Hence why it's multi-factor. They've used their pass, login and password, and then they've used in the pin prompt that was sent to their email or SMS, gaining them the access to the system. Our use of backup to protect data from loss, okay, that we have multiple servers and offline servers for storing data. That way, if our main servers go down, we can re recover the data from our backed up sources to keep the, the system functioning. And as mentioned before, the use of antivirus and anti-malware software, which keeps up to date with specific virus signatures and common threats out there, and then through its catalog is able to intercept them and put them into isolation when that data tries to in infiltrate the network. The final areas of cyber law and ethics. And with that, we obviously are looking at the impact of cyber breaches. And I said before, it can lead to a company going out of business for these reasons. The fact that financial loss, it costs money, they could steal money from the organization or hold them to ransom. The reputational damage, which is sometimes even worse in that the public know that this business was the victim of a cyber attack and do I trust my data with this business? Okay, it leads to massive disruptions in work, especially in areas where the system's either been taken down or you need to go through all your data and assess the damage level of the cyber threat, which takes away from your main business and isolates certain uh, data that people need to use as a part of their jobs. Okay, so it brings work to a halt, which obviously costs money in the long term as well. And the legal and regulatory ramifications. You've got to say, uh, commit it to the government that we did have a cyber breach and you've got to comply with what measures are, are known for letting your users know that you did have that cyber breach and telling them the regulations that they need to follow to ensure that their data is safe or what passwords they may need to change. So it says structures that need to be followed in to ensure that all parties are safe, not just the enterprise itself, but all users, supplies, other organizations are aware that you had a data breach, data was potentially leaked and giving them advice on what they need to do to keep their own data safe because it has been infiltrated through your system. It's not nice and a business does not want to go through this. The next areas of specific laws and legislation, laws exist at a state, federal and international level. And one of the most common laws known is the Privacy Act 1988, okay, as well as I mentioned before, the, the Freedom of Information Act 2, which obviously highlights how businesses need to take the acquisition and storage of people's data seriously and have these cybersecurity measures in place to ensure that that data does stay safe. But then also knowing too, who can view data, putting access rights and permissions on the data. So it's only being used for specific purposes by people who need to access that data. All of that is bound by law and we need to follow that. And then the final area, is a knowledge of current and emerging cybercrime threats. Okay, and we are in an era where this is a booming industry of cybersecurity because there are so many cyber threats out there. Okay, there have been ones that have infiltrated banks, health systems, uh, gaming platforms, and their online stores. Many have happened in previous years with people's data being exposed. So we've learned through seeing what are current ones happening. By having a knowledge and understanding of current threats, hopefully we can put measures in place to protect ourselves against it if we are going to go into that industry and enterprises can protect themselves. So I hope this video has given you an understanding of this third unit of the preliminary course of principles of cybersecurity. And really, it's so important that we protect our systems and why it is so important, because really, it could mean the life and death of an enterprise if they can or cannot protect the data of the users who interact with their systems.